Okay. Um, it is the top of the hour, and we are thrilled to have all of you joining us for today's Grants for Change reader training. Um, my name is Andrea, and I'm joined by Kristen, um, and we'll do a brief introduction uh, in just a second. A few housekeeping rules. Uh, the first one is just to acknowledge for you. <laughs> Hold on one second. I'm going to try and manage the video. Oh, you did it. Perfect. Um, this is the best part of having a co-host. Um, so uh, for all of you, um, just know that this session is being recorded. Um, the recording is a, going to be available throughout the reading period. So if there's something that you hear through this process that you have missed or that you want to just visit back again, um, we will be sending out this recording both shortly um, and uh, after that, we will be sending out the recording um, when we send you your proposals early next week. Um, I do want to ask that folks um, stop. Uh, so when you log in, we're not doing the um, video screen share. So when you do come on, if you find that your video, um, your webcam is being streamed and shared, um, if you could just click the stop video um, button on your control panel. That would be really helpful for us so everyone can see. We have about 30 people joining us um, and having everybody's photo there uh, would be really cumbersome for all of us to manage. So I really appreciate you helping out with that. Um, Kristen is also here and she'll be helping to navigate some of that back end stuff. So if you happen to see a panel pop up or something that looks weird, um, you can either type into the chat and let us know and the two of us will be kind of tag teaming there. Um, or you can um, type a message directly to Kristen and she'll be able to help you. So um, let's get started. Again, thank you so much for joining us today um, for our webinar. Um, so both myself, so I'm Andrea there on the right, um, and I'm joined by Kristen. Hello. Um, and we are really excited for you to um, be working with us on today's webinar and as readers. Um, we are, so my role here at Maine Initiatives is as the director of grant making, essentially. So I'm kind of the holder of the Grants for Change program and have been, this is my fourth year um, working through this process. So I'm really excited to share with you some of the wisdom and experience that I've gained. Um, and Kristen is here and is the person you probably hear from the most around all different logistics. Um, so she will be a familiar name for you as well. Right, so just a little bit about who we are at Maine Initiatives. Um, as I think many of you know, Maine Initiatives is a small community-based foundation focused on working on social, economic, and environmental justice. Um, our Grants for Change program is our largest program, uh, and we grant out uh, $250,000 a year to organizations who are specifically advancing racial justice in the Maine communities. Uh, we're really thrilled to have you joining us in this essential volunteer role uh, for us at our organization because we do believe strongly that um, grant making for community needs to be done by community. And so we're thrilled to be able to provide an opportunity for all of you to um, get to deeply be involved in this process, to share with us your thoughts, to, to help us to understand what it means to be um, part of the main initiatives community. So thank you so much for uh, joining us. I'm going to just take one second and see if I can get rid of I think I the thumbnail over there. All right, so we'll cool. work. We'll work that way. Um, so I'm sorry, this is our very first time using Zoom in this large kind of way. So we appreciate your flexibility and bearing with us as we um, go from what would normally be a five or six person meeting at most um, to what looks like close to 40 of you um, in the session today. So thanks, we're, we're grant makers, we're not technology folks necessarily. <laughs> um, so 
that is the brief overview of Maine initiatives, very brief. Um, and today I just want to review with you uh, the agenda for our session. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about kind of what it means to be a proposal reader. Uh, we'll spend some time reviewing briefly the applicants that we've had in so far, so who you're going to be learning all about. Um, we will discuss the process of kind of the nitty gritty of what it is that you need to be doing as a proposal reader what are your responsibilities what are the things that you should be looking out for we'll then touch briefly on our racial justice theme uh, we find it's really important to share with you um, kind of our vision about what we hope these grants will go to and then we'll do a pretty detailed walkthrough of the entire evaluation process so um, it's all done online and we'll walk you through step by step on what that um, online form looks like so that you know what you're getting into before you get started and then we'll close out and there will be time for questions I know that I talk fast um, and I believe that uh, Kristen here as well is um, one of the fast talkers in our community. So if things go too quickly for you, uh, just type into the chat and we'll be monitoring that. At any point, you can type in a question um, and we will at the end of each one of these sections pause um, and go through any questions that have come in from the community to make sure that um, we catch everything. And then, of course, Kristen and I are always available here in the office to answer any of your questions, either via email um, or are happy to pick up the phone and set up a conversation with you. Um, but with that, I'm going to turn things over briefly for Kristen to talk to you a little bit about our readers. You. Yes. Oh, this is you, actually. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Handing it back over. Handing it back to me. So um, we have 260 readers um, this year, and we're really excited to uh, have so many people from the community volunteer in this process. So just know as we go through this process, you are one of a large group of people who are all taking time this summer to step back and evaluate proposals for the racial justice program. Um, you are one part of the process of our grant making um, and you can see that we start off the process in June um, asking for people to apply, apply to be readers and also apply to um, have their organization funded by the Grants for Change program. Um, so that happens in June and July um, and now we're in the, the middle of this reader process um, here in the month of August. Um, so so now is the time where Kristen and I scramble a lot to make sure that everybody has sent in the forms that they need, everybody gets the proposals that they need um, to be reading, and then we sit back for half of August and half of September while you all do the work of reading and evaluating proposals and helping us through this process. Um, after we've collected all of your reader evaluations, we will be convening a subset of the 260 of you, so about 40 people, to be part of our grant making advisory committee. This committee will come together in October um, for a two day retreat at the Skudig Institute to build community, to build relationship and trust, to learn together about racial justice, and to take all the information that you as readers have provided, all of the evaluations, uh, and figure out, based on that information, how to come up with a cohort of 10 organizations. Um, then, in the end of November, beginning of December, uh, we'll be announcing the Grants for Change grantees uh, and those 10 new organizations along with the um, along with the organizations who've been part of the last three cohorts of Grants for Change will come together over the course of a three-year uh, grant period to learn together, to be part of presentations, to uh, kind of build the capacity of our wide community around racial justice. So um, I find it really exciting to kind of walk through this full process, knowing that the work that you're doing now is going to help support organizations for multiple years moving forward and help to build the capacity of our full organization and our full community around racial justice. 
So I just want to quickly um, share with you, we've gotten, you know, 260 readers, which means we have 260 statements from folks about why they're excited about this process. Uh, and I have two quotes here from readers who have been engaged in the process in the past. And I just wanted to read them out for you because I feel like they're really important points um, for us as we're thinking about this process. Um, this one says that reviewing proposals highlighted the macro and the micro responses to racial justice and equity that are possible, that there was a wide spectrum among the applications I read. It was important to consider both the value of a quick win or concrete advancement and a longer term investment. Both are critical to making a difference. And I feel like this quote um, is important to share with you all because I think it puts in context the, the challenge that you're up against. Um, in reading proposals, you're going to find three very different organizations, no matter which organization uh, you're, you're identified to read. And some of them are going to be short term answers to the problems or the issues of racial justice. And some of them are going to be a uh, much, much longer term kind of vision for the way our society could be moving forward. Uh, and it's going to be your challenge to think about, you know, where do you fall on this micro and macro response? Where do you fall on the balance of quick wins um, and long term investment? And to, to think about that for yourself and then to apply that lens or that perspective to the evaluations and the proposals that you, you read. Um, we really encourage you and we'll walk through the evaluation form. Um, we really encourage you to share with us your perspective um, in the conclusion paragraph of that form, uh, you know, and talk to this. Are you excited about the quick win? Or are you excited about the long term investment? Kind of where do you stand? And why did you evaluate the proposal the way you did? Now, this is one more um, quote, and I promise you this is not a full slide deck of quotes. Um, one more quote from a reader from last year that I also think is really valuable to put in context. So they said, I think hard about what it means to follow and support the leadership of people of color, and also about my own reluctance to let go of my privilege, and also not to use people of color leadership as an excuse to check out of participation and responsibility. This to me is kind of a dual purpose quote. Um, the first piece is that um, you're gonna read proposals and some things are gonna really speak to you and some things aren't. Um, and I really challenge you to think critically uh, about why that is. So what is getting you excited about this process and what are the things that are, are not as exciting and what does that mean about how you think about racial justice and how do you think about supporting people of color, the black indigenous folks in our community um, and, and kind of how you're prioritizing that. So this is really my challenge to you to uh, kind of do some, some internal learning about your perspectives on racial justice and to use that frame to help um, kind of illuminate why you've chosen to evaluate the proposals the way that you did. Um, and the, the last piece of this quote is really the, the challenge to keep it going. Um, so you have this amazing opportunity to volunteer this month um, or for the next four weeks in reading these proposals and evaluating them. Um, and I just want to you know, challenge you or give you the opportunity to know that your work in racial justice doesn't have to stop there. If this is the first way that you're engaging in this work or with these organizations, don't feel like um, you need to kind of step back after you've read proposals. It is really exciting to be part of this process. Um, and many, many folks we've heard over the years have read a proposal and then reached out to the folks to volunteer or made a donation or advocated to their legislators about an issue that they read about. And I really just want to encourage you maybe to make a personal um, goal. If, you, if you're not already volunteering or donating or doing work beyond this experience, as you go through the reading process, I really challenge you to think about one thing um, that you would do after you complete this process. What is your next step? Um, so I think this reader is, is really challenging themselves um, and challenging all of us to, to think, think about that moving forward. So now I'm really gonna <laughs> hand it over to Kristen to talk a little bit about the applicants in the pool. All right, so the applicants. This year we have had 24 organizations submit applications. 
Um, we are super, super excited about this pool of organizations. You can see them all listed out here. Um, you'll also see this list when you submit your conflict of interest forms. Um, yeah, and so you'll be, each of you will be assigned randomly three of these organizations to read and evaluate. And so we have these 24 organizations, but we only have 10 spots to fill for the cohort. Um, and so this is really your challenge as a reader. So you can see here this reading schedule. You'll see that the conflict of interest survey was supposed to be completed on August 12th. Um, so we do ask that um, for any of you whose form is outstanding that you try to submit that by the end of this week um, because that will allow us to um, send you your proposals on Monday, August 19th, and then that will give you that full month um, to read and evaluate your proposals by September 19th. And so you can see that conflict of interest form is linked here. Um, you also have seen it in the email this morning about the reminder of the webinar. Um, and when you open that form, we do kind of explain main initiatives point of view about what constitutes as a conflict. Um, but kind of just as a general rule, we do kind of um, advise that you just sort of err on the side of caution. So if there's an organization that you think you may have a conflict with, um, you may have a strong relationship with, for whatever reason, we do just recommend that you just uh, mark them as a conflict just to be on the safe side. As long as um, we're able to assign you three proposals that are conflict free, you should be good. So in general, the reader expectations are essentially that you submit this conflict form, that you come with an open mind, um, you read all of the applications that we send you and provide your honest feedback um, by the deadlines that we've provided. And so before we go on to the racial justice theme, I do want us to just pause here for a second because I know the two of us have gone through a ton of information in a brief amount of time. Um, are there questions um, that we can answer before we get to, knowing that we're going to get to a full walkthrough of the evaluation process, kind of that real technical piece. But um, if you have questions, feel free to type that into the chat and we'll just pause here for a minute um, for you to, to send in any of those questions you might have. All right, well, seeing no questions, um, again, feel free to send in those questions as we're talking. Um, if you hear us say something where you're like, huh, I wonder, um, it probably means that somebody else who's either currently on this webinar or who is going to be watching this recording uh, is thinking about it at this moment. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our racial justice theme. Um, we feel like it's a really important piece for us to um, dive deep into in this training process. It's often the thing that is the most fuzzy uh, for many of us involved uh, as proposal readers. And um, we're really eager to make sure that everyone is at least having um, a similar baseline. We want you to recognize that in um, in filling out this process or kind of going through this process that um, we are looking at specifically racial justice this year. So in the past, um, we have done um, a, a kind of wider view of what we were describing as a spectrum of racial justice to racial equity work. Um, so that was, you know, folks who were working at the structural or institutional level on, on advancing racial justice for our community, changing laws, changing policy, thinking really strategically about the way that community can be built and changed. So so that race is not predictive of life outcomes, um, all the way to the racial equity side where folks were um, working on addressing the, the results of a system that is inequitable and unjust. Um, and this particular year, uh, we've taken a much greater focus on specifically the racial justice piece. So I'll talk about that um, a little bit more in a second. But before I do, I just want to read for you um, the official definition that we are using at Maine Initiatives around racial justice and racial equity. So we believe that racial justice and equity are aspirational values of our community and that we affirm our collective commitment to creating a community in which all people are equally seen, valued, and respected, and race is not predictive of life outcomes. 
Now for us in this particular year, uh, we have been using a set of priorities uh, to help guide the applicants to the program. So specifically, um, we've identified three priorities that every applicant organization has had to take some time to answer and to figure out how do they respond to any one of these priorities. So I'm going to run through all three priorities with you and, and give a little bit of a background as to what we mean in this case um, or what we mean about this particular priority. I want to be very clear, however, that in order to be a successful applicant for our Grants for Change program, an organization does not need to highly meet every single one of these priorities. Um, it is not, we're not looking for the very center of the Venn diagram of all three priorities, but instead we're looking for organizations that address at least one of these priorities strongly. So our first priority is around who we are focusing on. Um, and in this year's process, we are prioritizing the indigenous Native American and particularly the Wabanaki community as well as the black and African American community in both the decision making process and that is represented within our grant making advisory committee this year and in our funding decisions. So when you're doing your evaluation and reading organizations applications you will see um, each one of them addressing whether the organization is led by black, indigenous, or other people of color, um, whether they are specifically uh, both prioritizing work led by and directed um, to support the indigenous Native American Wabanaki communities and the black and African American communities uh, in Maine. Um, it is definitely a distinction from previous years. So if you were to visit our website and to scroll through the last three years of uh, Grants for Change recipients, um, you'll see that we have not supported a vast number um, of organizations who would fit necessarily in these categories. Much more of our, our past grantees fall in a category around um, the immigrant population in particular. Um, and this priority is specifically addressing um, that, that what we see to be an imbalance within the previous grantee pool. Um, and in particular, I think that this priority has given a lot of confidence for a lot of organizations led by Black and African American and Indigenous Native American and Wabanaki communities to put in an application uh, in the way that they haven't necessarily felt um, confident in doing before. And so as you're looking at the pool, um, you'll see that this particular priority set um, is helping us to refine uh, the community that we're supporting. I want to be very clear, however, that that does not mean that organizations that are led, either, led by um, either immigrant communities or by white individuals are disqualified. Again, this is one of three priorities, um, but we did want to identify who are directly negatively impacted by the history and legacy of slavery and colonization uh, as part of our grant process. So I'm going to go through all three priorities and then I will stop for any questions. This is definitely explained um, in the letter that accompanied the request for proposals and we'll make sure to share that letter with you when we send your applications uh, early next week. Our second priority is um, around the type of focus that we're taking um, within the work that we look to fund. Um, and in, in particular, we're looking to support organizations that are doing work on institutional, structural, and success systemic expressions of racial injustice and inequity. Um, we are specifically looking to fund organizations that are, are working at that high level of justice work. So thinking about how to change institutions, how to change structures, how to change systems that are in place to make uh, impact, long-term impact um, in our community. That might represent itself in a variety of different ways. Uh, that might mean making 
being a all um, person of color space uh, where folks can come together to do their individual personal self-care work or their individual professional work. Um, that might mean changing the food systems so that we eliminate food deserts um, specifically in poor um, and black, indigenous, and people of color um, focused communities. That might mean changing the way that um, nonprofit systems are set up um, around uh, 501c3 status and fiscal sponsorship. Each one of those different examples uh, tags back to organizations within the pool. And I could answer this question for most of the organizations within the pool. And it's gonna be your challenge to think critically about that. Um, we are going to send, when we send our proposals to you next week, uh, a document that outlines specifically um, uh, uh, racial justice learning and background. So it is, we're calling it our racial justice resource guide, and it has a lot of great videos and articles, um, and then a lit list of books and movies for deeper reading on a variety of different topics. Um, so if this is something that feels confusing to you or something that you feel like you haven't um, like jumped deep enough into in order to read proposals, we are sending along this guide that will provide for you um, access to information in a variety of different modes of uh, interpretation as well. So some podcasts, some videos, some books, some movies. Um, so we're excited about this particular priority. And then our third priority um, is really hearkening back to kind of the main initiatives um, founding. Uh, so when main initiatives began, we were specifically an organization focused on funding organizations doing grassroots advocacy and uh, community organizing work. Uh, and in this year's Grants for Change program, we really hope to uh, shine a light on that type of work happening. It's work that's really hard to fund um, in our community. It's work that's often hard to quantify. Um, and it's work that we, we know is essential to making change within our communities. So um, we are putting a particular priority on community building, community organizing, and grassroots advocacy work um, that uses strategies, um, uses those types of strategies to create policy change um, and to advance racial justice in our community. All right, so that was a lot. Um, so I wanna just pause here before we move on um, to talk about the actual pieces of the proposal to see what questions have come up for you. Um, are, there, are there things hanging out there that um, you wanna make sure that we talk a little bit more about? Um, you can use the chat, uh, so type into the chat, we'll see that. And um, right now I'm gonna pause and see if anybody has any questions. Great, um, so there's a question specifically about um, pre-screening. So is there a pre-screening process to make sure that all applicants meet at least one priority? Um, we have, as staff, kind of run through and done an initial screening for um, completion of applications. We've done an initial screening for um, meeting some core eligibility criteria. So for us, eligibility includes um, having a either a 501c3 um, nonprofit status themselves, having a fiscal sponsor, um, or being sponsored particularly by one of the Wabanaki tribal communities. So we've done screening for that. We've done screening around budget. Um, there's a million dollar cap for organizations who can apply, and we've pulled out organizations that uh, don't meet that criteria. Uh, and we uh, do do screening to make sure that it's not an application that feels very far outside of the realm of the priorities that we have. Um, however, one of the things that we do have within our application, and you'll um, you'll hear from Kristen about this specific piece is um, we've identified a red flag opportunity for all of you as readers that if you feel like something just doesn't fit the priorities or feels off, um, there's an opportunity for you to specifically identify that. 
Um, additionally, there, um, there's been kind of an in initial pass by us, but we do feel like all of the applications that we're going to send out to you right now um, are at a place where they, to us, meet enough of the criteria to go out to the reader population. We may um, reserve the opportunity when the reader feedback comes back to screen out um, a, a particular proposal um, from the grant making retreat process, but um, we have um, confidence that at least the proposals that we're putting out this year are going to meet that criteria. Next question. So um, if an applicant meets all three of the priorities, does that mean it's the strongest proposal? Um, I think there's, there's like two answers to that question. Um, if it's like squarely perfect for all three, then yes, um, that's going to make it a really strong application within this process. However, um, we are um, a unique grant making process in that we're not rate we so you as readers are rating organizations individually based on their own merits we take all of that information and when we bring it to the decision making process at the grant making retreat um it becomes a process where we're thinking more as um a collection of organizations how do we effectively build um, a cohort of 10 organizations that complement each other and that tell a story about all the priorities uh, and all of the, the focus on racial justice that's happening across the state. Um, so there's a little bit of both. For you as readers, um, feel free to evaluate based on the individual organization. And if you see an organization that fits all three of those really strongly, then absolutely that would be really strong. Um, and there's one more question in here. Um, it says, is there a priority to represent Native American, Wabanaki, and African American readers in this process? Um, and that's a great question. And the answer is yes. So um, we tried to do some really targeted outreach with our um, proposal reader application process to identify uh, and to make sure that it got out to um, the, the communities um, that we're working to prioritize. And then in particular, we've put a really substantial priority on making sure that there's representation from the, the Wabanaki and the African American Black community here in Maine on the grant making committee. Um, as well as on our board who has has the ultimate fiduciary um, and official responsibility of approving the grants that come from the grant making committee. So um, we are we are trying to put that initial priority uh, both as a as a focus of the grant making decisions um, and at, in the decision making process itself. All right, any other questions? These are great. Um, we will certainly have time at the end to answer additional questions, so feel free to um, feel free to continue to, to send those in. Um, so we want to just quickly talk a little bit about what it means to uh, really apply these themes. Um, so apply these different priorities. And I just want to go over with you a few different elements. So the first is when you're reading proposals, I want you to really think about um, how the organization is talking about racial justice. So does the, the language that they're using feel in tune with the knowledge that you have about racial justice? Are there things that don't feel um, perfectly thought through? All of that is fine. We have a lot of organizations in the pool who are brand new or who are just emerging into this space. But part of the challenge for you is to really think about how are they articulating their racial justice view of their work? Um, and then I want you to think about whether the organization has racial justice at the core of their work or whether it is just a component. Neither of these are the one and only way to go, um, but it's going to be important for us as we're pulling together this pool to be thoughtful about where racial justice sits with organizations. Some of the organizations in the pool have a racial justice program um, and others are applying a racial justice lens to everything that they're doing. Um, and I think that it's, it's your challenge to think about how that feels um, and include that, you know, think about that perspective as you're evaluating those organizations. 
Um, do notice that there are a number of questions about who's leading the organization um, and how much that leadership reflects the community that their work is focused on. That is something that's really important to us. Um, we strongly believe in a for us, by us model, um, and we really look for organizations that can articulate um, how they are being led by people of color within their process. Um, and so keep an eye, there is a question um, specifically asking how your organization is led. Um, and I found in the past that that was a really uh, valuable response um, when I was thinking about how strong I thought an application was. Um, and finally, just a reminder that organizations do not need to address all three of the core priorities, but instead need to hit, hit at least one of them uh, solidly. So things to consider. Again, we're looking for a range of organizations that represent multiple approaches and sectors. Um, you know, we want organizations that work on gender equity and workers' rights and uh, immigrants' rights and economic justice and climate change and environmental justice. You know, a, a pool of organizations that um, are addressing a wide range of sectors helps us to reinforce the fact that racial justice needs to be at the core of all of the work that's happening in our community, whether it's in the economic justice sector, whether it's in finance, or whether it's in workers' rights. Um, and so just, you know, keep in mind there isn't one particular area that we think, or one particular sector um, that is more important to focus on than others. Um, additionally, our applicants are at a range of organizational and budget development. Some of them um, are going to be really well-established organizations that have been around for a long time, have really substantial budgets. That's okay. Um, that As long as they're not over a million dollars, they still qualify. Um, some of our organizations will have never received a single dollar in grant funding or donations, and they're all volunteer. Um, that is also okay, too. We we acknowledge that um, this work is happening in a range of different organizational maturity levels um, and we're excited to support all of them. Um, and then finally, just a reminder that we're looking to select a cohort of 10 organizations that help to tell a story about the work that's happening in Maine. Um, so having organizations that are different is not a bad thing. Um, we're really excited to have a wide range of organizations that signal to the community all the different ways that we can advance racial justice for Mainers. Oh, sorry, skipped one. Um, so follow, uh, final piece is that recognizing that implicit bias exists in all of us. So, um, important for you to know, and I just want to say this out loud, because we found in the first year, we didn't say this, with our readers, um, and our readers systematically penalized organizations who were small in size, who used English not as their first language, who were more volunteer, who had never received a grant before, um, and that was not what we were looking for. So we wanna be really clear that typical things that you would prioritize within a grant making process may or may not apply here and typically don't. Um, the, the first thing is that you may be reading an application where the bones of the application are really exciting and amazing. The organization is doing really creative things, but English may not be their first language. They may have never written a grant before. Um, try your hardest to not get distracted um, by uh, professional grant writing skills uh, when evaluating the organization. Instead, it's your challenge to think about what the organization is saying that they're doing uh, and supporting them as they move forward. Additionally, organizational size um, and budget or maturity are not things that we want you to be um, evaluating based on. Um, again, being big enough to hire a professional grant writer does not mean that an organization is more qualified to receive funding through this program. At the same time, um, a big organization might actually be a really good fit. And just because they're much larger than others doesn't mean that they also should be disqualified. 
Um, and I think that, you know, the number of volunteers versus paid staff, it tracks in the same way. Um, making sure that you are leaving room and space for both volunteer led and professionally staffed organizations to be part of this cohort. We find that the mix of that is actually a huge value when we're doing capacity building work for all the organizations. Um, and uh, finally, I'll say that it is 100% okay for this to be the first grant that an organization has ever gotten. Um, in fact, we really find that um, when we're doing this work, we need to take risks. And so we are not risk adverse. We do not mind. And in fact, we get excited about organizations where we would be um, giving them more money than they've ever had. Um, before where we were giving them a grant where we don't know if they're going to be able to have the bookkeeping background to manage them. All of those pieces, we are ready to support them as they go through the process. We can help them to secure a fiscal sponsor if they don't have one. We can help them to secure bookkeeping support um, or grants management support if they don't have that. Um, but instead, we want you to read based on the understanding and the evaluation of the organization itself. Okay. Kristen is going to talk to you now um, about the proposal evaluation process. So the what to do and how. Right. So this piece, this will be, um, this is the more technical piece and will look very familiar for those of you who have participated as a reader in our process before. Um, so an important thing to know, when you're going through the evaluation form, each of the questions that you're asked or the evaluation criteria that you are provided will be directly connected to a question or a set of questions in the proposal themselves. Um, and we will go through that kind of step by step. We'll go through it a little quickly. So if a question comes up for you, feel free again to just always type that into the chat. Um, so just a few things to note before you dive into your proposals about these grants. Um, first is that these are all general operating support grants. Um, so they're not, this, this funding is not tied to a specific program or project, um, but we really, you know, empower these organizations to use this funding um, in whatever ways that they see fit to advance their mission and vision. Um, the second is that these grants are all for $25,000 each. Um, so applicants don't need to specify the amount of money that they're asking for because it's implied that they're asking for the $25,000. And lastly, that $25,000 is spread over the course of three years. So they will receive, if selected, um, a $10,000 grant in 2019, a $10,000 grant in 2020, and then the final $5,000 in 2021. I'm going to move this. Um, so for a time estimate, we typically say that it takes about one to two hours to review each proposal, totaling about three to six hours. Um, but again, you do have a full month to um, submit all of your proposals, so you can divide that however is most convenient for you. Um, and so what we'll do with all of the great substantive input that you provide us um, is we really, we compile all of the um, evaluations in which we'll receive this year about 30, um, 30 evaluations for each proposal. Um, and we'll kind of compile that into evaluative ratings that will be used by the grant making committee um, to aid in their decision making. Um, and so this is really kind of like a community input for them to, um, to reflect on and to, to, you know, think about certain questions that readers may bring up. Um, and to sort of guide the discussion um, at the grant making committee retreat. Um, we also use all of this feedback from readers um, um, to the applicants themselves. So if they ask for feedback, um, we try to make this a uh, transparent process if any of the applicants um, want to know more about how the grant decisions were made. Ah, oh. <laughs> One second. Ah. Oh, I think it's down here. There we go. Oh, we got it. Okay. And we're back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so for the evaluation form itself, this is essentially what the first page um, will look like. Um, you'll be asked to put your email address first. And I do just want to note that you want to make sure that you enter that information correctly because you will receive kind of a confirmation or receipt email after you submit that. So making sure that that is in properly is important. 
Um, you will select from a drop down list the proposal, the organization that you are reviewing, but we also ask that you put the proposal number of that last question there. Um, and the way to find that number is when we email you the files for each organization, um, there'll be a little number attached to the file name and the folder for each organization. Um, and that just helps us make sure that you are reviewing the proposal that you say you are reviewing. So this is essentially getting into the actual assessment. Um, you'll see here the first question is around organizational assessment, kind of what are your first impressions of the organization and its mission. Um, and you have the opportunity to sort of write that on a scale, um, but there's also the opportunity to write any questions or clarification in that box there, though it is not required. So next we have the work assessment, um, asking, you know, does this organization's programmatic approach make sense to you? Um, does this organization make the case that their programs and activities will bring about the impact they seek? And again, can leave comments there if you would like. And so then we get into those three priorities that Andrea was talking about. Um, so the first being, um, you know, to what extent does this organization advance racial justice by addressing systemic, structural, and institutional expressions of racial injustice? Um, and you'll have the opportunity to sort of break that on a one through 10 scale. That second priority, the same thing, um, kind of rating to what extent does this organization um, prioritize leadership by and work that strengthens Maine's Native American, Wabanaki, Indigenous communities and or um, African American and Black communities. And then the same thing for that third priority, um, kind of about the strategies that the organization is using, if they're doing community organizing, grassroots advocacy and policy um, change as part of their central strategies for advancing racial justice and equity. Um, and again, just to reiterate one more time, um, you don't, the, an organization doesn't have to reflect all three of those priorities perfectly, but the hope is that at least one of them, they are um, addressing in a significant way. And then again, you'll have an opportunity to um, leave any comments or clarification or raise any questions in that comment box. Then we move on to the target population, you know, asking, um, does this organization's work clearly benefit Black, Indigenous, and or other people of color in Maine. Next, really turn leadership. So does this organization increase capacity and leadership within the community that they seek to serve? And then we have the success story, um, which all the applicants are asked to provide kind of a, a vision for their success, a success story that they've had. Um, and you'll kind of rate just a yes, somewhat no, as to whether you find that compelling and important and timely. Um, and I'll just jump in before we get to this very last piece. Um, oh, oh, just keep going. Uh, so before we get to that very last piece, I just want to say that each one of the sections that we just reviewed viewed are directly connected to mm -hmm. a question that was asked um, to the applicants themselves. So you should be able to do a one-to-one -one comparison. You should be able to read the, their question, mm -hmm. um, read what they said, and then go back to that um, box and check the, the bullet that you think most applies. So hopefully right. it's really straightforward on both sides. All of the applicants also saw this evaluation form at, uh, before they applied so that it's we've tried to make it really transparent as to exactly what it is that they'll be evaluated on right so then you'll do sort of an overall rating so after you read this proposal and you've gone through this evaluation you know is this one of your top choices do you think this merits funding do you not think this proposal should be funded at this time um, out of your three you can rate if you love all three and all three make you really excited you can write that all three are your top choices you don't have to necessarily rank the three that you're given in any particular way. Um, and then this is the only section that we do ask to actually write in that comment box um, to explain your answer. Um, just kind of giving the high level impression of why you rated the proposal the way that you did. And so this is the, the kind of last section of the proposal evaluation that Andrea mentioned where um, you have the opportunity to raise anything you see as a red flag. So if anything made you um, question something about the organization's budget or something about something in the proposal that 
didn't sit well with you or um, raised some concern or question, um, this is the place to flag that and to um, write that out. So as I said, why it's important to make sure you um, use the right email address, um, you will receive, this is essentially the email that you will receive, um, like a thanks for filling out this evaluation, and then you will have an opportunity if you, you know, you think back and you want to actually change your response, um, you can just click that edit response button um, and change any of your answers as you see fit. And if you would like to sit, submit another response, this is the page that appears um, in the Google form itself when you hit submit. Um, they will give you an option there as well to edit your response or you can click submit another response. Um, alternatively, if you just click the evaluation Google form link from the email when we send that to you, um, it will open up a new evaluation. So important to note that you don't have to evaluate all three at once. Um, you can submit one at a time and kind of space that timing out however is convenient. Great, so I'm gonna go through some quick closing pieces and then we'll have time for additional questions. Thank you, Kristen. Um, so what's next? Um, we ask that you, um, if you haven't already, to please complete the conflict of interest survey. It is very, very brief. It will take you literally one or two minutes. Um, we really do need the answers to that survey before we can send out your proposals. So if you haven't submitted it already um, and we don't have it by Monday, we will not send you your proposals. Instead, you will get a hot, like tons and tons <laughs> of follow-up emails from us asking you to submit the proposal. Um, I do want to uh, remind you that we'll be sending out the racial justice reading guide um, via email when we send out proposals on Monday. Um, and we do ask that once you get your proposals on Monday, you do a few things. So first, um, check them all and make sure that um, you have, uh, you don't have any conflicts with any of those proposals. So we find every year um, we send a proposal to people and somebody opens it up and reads a board list and goes, oh my gosh, my best friend's on the board. Um, and they just reach back out to us and we can change the proposal that they'll be reviewing. That is totally fine, but we won't know unless you let us know. So um, please do, when you get your proposals, just double check and make sure that that's all good for you. Um, and then you can move forward. Um, and at any time, feel free to give us a call here in the office. Um, I will definitely say you can always call us, but um, the, you know, the, the voicemail system here takes us about 24 hours to get through. So just be patient if you give us a phone call. Um, however, we're always available online by email, and you can email us either Andrea at maininitiatives.org or Kristen at maininitiatives.org, and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Um, we also want to encourage you to stay involved. As I mentioned before, um, it is such um, an honor for us to have you reading proposals for us and participating in such a deep way. Um, we are excited to try and bring readers together um, this fall um, and into the winter to continue the conversation about racial justice and racial equity. So um, keep an eye out. We're going to be pretty busy through October um, finishing up this process, but once we announce our grantees, we'll be reaching out to you again um, to try and get you all together. We in the past have done reader happy hours. Um, we've all met for, um, for snacks at different restaurants um, all around Maine. So we really just want to get a chance to meet you and for you to be able to meet other folks in the community. And finally, thank you. We are so appreciative of all of the work um, that you are about to do for us. Um, and I just want to say having 260 readers is amazing. Um, we are we're so thrilled to have so many people in the community to be affirmatively um, confirming that that they support racial justice and racial equity and that you're willing to do the work to make that happen. Um, we do need each and every one of you to do this process. Um, as a reader, uh, the more readers we have, the closer we get to having statistically significant data um, that really helps us to analyze and interpret the work that's happening in our community and to make decisions about where the grant should go. So um, we're just so thrilled to have you all joining us. 
Um, I am gonna pause here. So we have a few minutes left and we're happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, if you find that you were having diff trouble with any of the technology, just a reminder that um, we will be emailing everyone with a copy of this recording that you can watch uh, in the future um, or watch again, because I know you wanna <laughs> hear us talk for another hour, um, but we're really thrilled to have all of you and um, I'll just pause here and see if you have any follow up questions. All right. Um, well, not seeing any questions. Um, I really, again, want to just say thank you to everyone. Uh, feel free to reach out if you have any um, questions or anything that we can help with um, over the next month or so. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank Thanks you so much. Everyone. Thanks, everyone.